um, maybe. Okay. Um, all right, so I am delighted to introduce Professor McCoy. She is the Nat Lingerfelter Professor, I hope I'm saying that right, of chemistry at the University of Washington. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Washington State Academy of Sciences. She's served as the senior editor and deputy editor for the Journal of Physical Chemistry. And for many years, she's been very active in the Phys Division of the ACS. And this past fall, she was elected to become the vice chair of the Division of Chemical Physics of the APS. And that's just a fraction of her credentials. So we're delighted to have her present today. Um, please give her your full attention. Thank you, thank you, Heather. And thank you everyone from the Astrochemical Division for giving me this opportunity to tell you about some things that we've been working on. Some of it has been for quite a while. Other aspects of it are actually very new. Um, and I should say also thank you everyone who's here. I was looking at the list of participants and there are a lot of people, a lot of familiar names, lots of people, and I just wish we could all be in person sometime soon. But let me jump into my talk and what I wanna tell you about. And so since this is an astrochemistry focused seminar, I think it's useful to contextualize what we're doing in the context of molecules that have been observed. And they're every year, they're more and more. And some of them are molecules that are common that my general chemistry students would be very comfortable naming and thinking about. Some are more exotic, and many of these have very large amplitude motions. In addition to the list, there are a number of molecules that have not been observed, but based on the chemistry are proposed. And some of these are equally exotic and contain large amplitude motions. And those of us, those of you who are familiar with some of our work know that we've done a lot of work, particularly looking at CH5 plus and H5 plus over now going on the past um, 20 years. And so what I wanna think about within the context of these molecules in the context of the large amplitude motions is basically what are the challenges associated with studying them? And then how can we start addressing some of these challenges? And so as we think, and I put H5 plus and CH5 plus, because those will be two of our example molecules. As we think about these, one of the challenges is that the sort of off the shelf vibrational spectroscopy approaches are unlikely to be effective. And by that, I mean the ones that we can go to games or go to Gaussian, and put in appropriate keywords and magically a spectrum appears. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One is, is that these molecules contain very large amplitude motions, as we'll see in a second. In H5+, plus, this, share, this excess proton in the middle undergoes extremely large amplitude motions back and forth between the H2 groups. In the case of CH5+, plus, there's considerable scrambling of the hydrogens around the carbon core. And so what I've drawn here, which are close to either low energy or equilibrium structures of the molecules, really don't reflect the symmetry averaged, vibrationally averaged structure that you're going to be seeing when one's thinking about either the rotational spectroscopy or the vibrational spectroscopy. Additionally, for the same types of reasons, low order expansions that really make vibrational spectroscopy easier, either in a harmonic type of picture or with vibrational perturbation theory, aren't going to work very well when you've got a potential that sample that has multiple low energy minima and ground state wave functions that not only sample all these minima, but can also sample the transition states that separate the minima. And so if we want to be able to study these molecules, we need two things. The first is we need an approach that's going to allow us to study the spectra, spectra and structure of the molecules. And as critically, and one of the things I want to focus on today is we need a way to get the potential energy surfaces, because if we can't use a low order expansion, we're going to need to somehow sample electronic, use, use electronic structure to sample a broad wage, range of geometries and then somehow fit a potential. And those of you who've heard me speak before and have followed our work know that their answer to the first problem is diffusion Monte Carlo, um, which is a method that we've used quite a bit. And I'm just gonna give a very high level overview of. So the strengths and the reasons why we wanna use diffusion Monte Carlo to study these systems is it's an extremely general approach um, for studying molecules and particularly ones that undergo large amplitude motions. 
It doesn't rely on a careful choice of coordinates. It doesn't rely on a clean zero order description of the structure of the molecule. And in principle, it will scale well with system size. And I have a whole nother talk that talks about why that isn't always the case and how we can deal with that. But for the purposes of this talk, it will scale reasonably well for system sizes. And so we can move from looking at a triatomic molecule to at the end, we'll look at a molecule with seven atoms without a lot of adjustment to the overall algorithm. The approach, um, again, I'm gonna be fairly high level. The basic idea and the reason why we don't have to worry about getting good zero order descriptions and everything else is we represent our wave function rather than representing it as a product of harmonic oscillator wave functions or something like that. We represent it as an um, ensemble of localized functions that are basically allowed to move around the configuration space over a series of small time steps. At the end of each time step, um, we basically move, we add additional walkers in geometries that are low in energy, remove walkers that are in geometries that are in the classically forbidden region of the potential. We do this based on this BREF quantity. And at long times, once we've allowed, basically it's almost like heat, hitting a thermodynamic type of equilibrium and the equations are consistent with that. At long times, our density of the walkers near a geometry provides the amplitude of the wave function. And with a few tricks, we can get our probability amplitudes. And the time average value of um, this reference energy provides the zero point energy. And so we can very, in a very straightforward way, get ground state wave functions, get probability amplitudes, which we can project. We can average um, rotational constants over the geometry so we can get vibrationally average rotational constants with some tricks we can get excited states and so we've got a way to get at a lot of information about molecules that are difficult to study by other methods as i mentioned we've been doing this for a while and so i just because i started motivating with ch5 plus and h5 plus thought i just put up a few results on these systems um, types of insights we can get, um, for example, this is H5 plus projecting the probability amplitude onto the distance the shared proton from each of the two outer H2 groups. This was work of Zhou Lin, who graduated a number of years ago and is now uh, an assistant professor at UMass Amherst. And what she showed was that this is, you start looking at the numbers, these are extremely large amplitude motions. The range, the distance of this hydrogen proton from the H2 goes from three quarters of an angstrom to one and three quarters angstrom. As you start deuterating, the blues are representing deuterium, you can actually shift the amplitude toward, um, in this case, closer to the H2 group. And you can um, actually generate an asymmetry in the ground state vibrationally average structure that's conducive to a dipole moment. And so once you deuterate it, you actually are picking up a permanent dipole from the structure you're also picking up additional contributions from the fact that your center of charge is actually now moving away from the center of mass to these systems. And so you can start getting insights into both vibrational spectroscopy and also rotational structure for this molecule. In the case of CH5+, plus, um, really interesting molecule. Um, these are plots of the um, prob ground state probability amplitude projected onto the HH distances. It's actually almost a bimodal distribution with a peak that is, is associated with a shorter HH distance and then a larger peak associated with all of the longer HH distances. And again, with deuteration, you can really change around structurally what this looks like. And one of the things that was really fun was when you put three deuteriums and two hydrogens, you basically build up all of the HH distances are in this one peak, or in other words, the hydrogens tend to localize in this region, in these two, positions that are associated with a short H2 type of feature where the deuteriums end up down there. And again, I could give a whole talk about these systems, but what I want to think about more is how can we move beyond systems where we have potentials. And so both of these studies were really facilitated by the fact that Joel Bowman and others have developed potential surfaces that we could then use within the context of our DMC. And the question we started asking just over a year ago was, can we find a way to be able to do the DMC, basically developing surfaces on the fly for similar molecules, 
so that we can start studying systems where there others haven't already gone in and gotten potentials and really free ourselves up to be able to do the whole problem and not be reliant on having potential surfaces. And this, I should say, was really the brainchild of Fenris Liu, who at the time was an undergraduate and is now a first year graduate student in the group, and Ryan Dricio, who is a senior graduate student who is defending about a month from now. So the basic idea of what we call neural net DMC is rather than using someone else's ab initio data fit to a potential surface and then run the DMC, we take a sidestep and we use small DMC simulations to correct, co collect training data, which we can then fit um, to a neural net, a multi-layered neural net, then use the fact that these neural nets are very easily implemented for GPU accelerated evaluations of the potential, which then will allow us for, to do the production run DMCs much more efficiently. And also, as I'll talk about in the second part, one can imagine even skipping this step and going directly from the ab initio data directly to getting the training data for the neural nets. But let's start with a situation where we have potentials and we can calibrate the method and see how well this will work. So the first, issue that we encountered was the fact that while you can imagine using a method to calculate potential energies to then do larger stimulations with the method, if we look at sort of the range of energies that are sampled by a standard ground state DMC simulation, that's shown in red here. And what you can see is, is that you get, even if the zero point energy in this case is CH5 plus is about 10,000 wave numbers, you're actually sampling energies that are quite a bit larger. And the volume of phase space that corresponds to these larger energies is quite a bit larger than the volume corresponding to the very low energies. And so what Fenris and Ryan figured out was that really, if we want to do a good job of sampling the geometries we need to have to be able to do the DMC simulation, we need to have more higher energy structures. And they accomplished this by running DMC, not only for the regular masses of the atoms, but for um, situations where the masses were actually um, decreased by as much as an order of magnitude. And that's what these orange, yellow, uh, and per down to the purple distributions are, is showing what the distributions of energies that are sampled by these reduced mass type of calculations. By averaging these together to get this black distribution, we now have a set of data that really samples much better the regions of higher energy. So that was the first challenge. The second was we need, if we're going to do a neural net, we need some way to take the molecular geometry and compact it to a, into some type of vector descriptor that will take into account the fact there's permutational symmetry. Obviously, rotating the molecule shouldn't change the energy, and so taking into that into account. And there are a number of different ways to do this. We really wanted to be able to do this step within TensorFlow or to use the GPUs to do it. And so the approach that um, we decided to use was a so-called Coulomb matrix, where basically you can um, set up a matrix, a matrix based on the atom-atom distances, and then you can rearrange the order of the columns of the matrix based on the magnitudes of the um, elements of that column. And for something like CH5+, plus, which can readily isomerize, that becomes really important. The advantage is it's efficient. The disadvantage is that you can pick up some discontinuities as, as you're stretching a particular bond, it may change which of the CH distances it thinks you're looking at. And so that gets a little bit complicated, but it seems, it's not, it seems like that's not a huge problem as we actually look at molecular structures. So once one goes in and fits, this kind of standard thing to do is to compare the reference energy, um, the calculated energies by other methods to what we get from the neural net. This is again CH5 plus, and it looks pretty linear. The overall um, errors, this is our, um, this is our um, training error. This is using just the ground state information from the DMC. And then this is using more, more information, as you can see, using calculating the errors in the point the structures we fit and ones we didn't fit from a similar data set is very similar in size. If we only focus on the ground state, the errors go down. Now, I find this to be slightly difficult to really interpret what's going on. And so another way of looking at all of this is to plot the error in the potential energy as a function of the reference energy. And this is plotted as a heat map on a log scale. 
And what I want you to notice is, is that really independent of how high in energy we go, the average error is very close to zero. It's e relatively equally distributed on both sides. And so when we go in and use this potential for quantum mechanical calculation, which is really long wavelength averaging over a lot of structures, this noise, if you like, in the um, fit to the potential is going to basically cancel out. It's going to be like white noise. So we don't need to worry too much about it. Now, I can say that and I can hope that, but really the proof is in the actual calculations. And so we also use this to calculate, for example, ground state energies, which is something we can do fairly readily with the DMC. Um, these are the results of previous studies um, using fairly si sizable distributions of roughly 20,000 walkers. And these are the zero point energies that are obtained using the neural net fit to the same potential surface. And what I want you to notice is, is that in all cases, while the numbers may be a little bit different, we really are agreeing quite well between the potential we're fitting to and the potential we have. What's really nice though, is that because we're doing everything on GPUs, once we have the neural net potential, we're not as limited in terms of the size of simulations we're able to do. And so in fact, I mean, Fenris was showing self-control here. Um, he redid all the simulations with an ensemble 10 th times larger. And you can see not only are the energies agreeing, they look very nicely converged. So that's good. We can also look at, for example, the types of distributions I showed earlier. This is for CH5+, where we're looking at the distribution of um, HH distances as a function of deuteration, and then looking at it for the single, the different types of deuterate isotope logs, focusing just on HH distances. I should probably put these right on top of each other. I don't have that animated today, but. You, looking at these, you can see that really the results are looking nearly indistinguishable. And so that's all great. And I says, oh, and I should, you know, but wait, there's more. Um, this is, we also looked at water dimer using um, the potential for the Paisani group, just to illustrate that even for these relatively fast potentials, we can gain as much as an order of magnitude savings in terms of CPU time. So we can really get a lot out by doing this. But I suspect what some of you are saying, and this is certainly something that we've heard from reviewers um, on some of this work, is that's just great, but you're really not gaining all that much. You can do things faster, but on the other hand, you already have the potential. So what are you really buying yourself by doing these calculations? And so one can ask, you know, can one, and instead of going with potentials that already exist, could one take a molecule where there isn't a potential and do the same thing? And that's what we've been doing over the last um, several months. And so the idea is, is rather than taking ab initio data, running, you know, ask either us or someone else getting a potential surface and then doing this whole neural net procedure, could we start directly with the ab initio data? The problem is, is that you want to do high enough a level of electronic structure theory that you've got reliable results. But even to get our training data, we're running calculations that are requiring easily millions of potential evaluations. And so Ryan and uh, Mark Boyer have done really nice work in parallelizing our code and getting it to work very quickly but it's still a lot of work. And so we've collaborated with Tom Miller and his group who have developed some really nice machine learning approaches, um, actually Gaussian regression approaches for taking hartree fock energies and introducing the correlation correction. So that they're basically getting CCSD parentheses T level of accuracy in their energies, but only actually running a hartree fock calculation. And although the hartree fock calculations are still expensive, that actually is enough to make this tractable. And so that's what we've done. We've run now some DMC simulations to correct training, collect training data, basically running a bunch of calculations, both at regular masses and then at smaller masses, and then using that information to then seed our neural nets to then go run production DMC. We've done this for CH5+, 
We've done it for water. Unfortunately, since there are already potentials there, that's not very exciting. So we started thinking, can we do this for other molecules? And the molecule we decided to focus on to start with is this protonated ethylene molecule. And this is kind of a fun molecule because A, there's spectroscopy. This is a spectrum from Mike Duncan's group when Gary Doberly was a postdoc. Um, Otto Dopfer has also uh, measured the spectrum of this. In both cases, these are argon tag spectra. And what they see is, is that based on both electronic structure theory and the, the spectra, the structures that they're observing are these non-classical bridged um, three center two electron bonds with this excess, excess proton. This band at about um, 2160 wave numbers corresponds to displacement of this proton perpendicular to the CC bond. Um, and there's really no evidence for this. And actually on the potential, this structure is a transition state. But on the other hand, this is kind of a fun one because you can imagine if you could excite in this direction, the frequency of this vibration is a couple hundred wave numbers, you potentially could be driving this toward this structure. And there's really not a lot known about sort of how large amplitude or small amplitude motions there are in this molecule. So we've run produ small production, small DMC simulations to gather training data. This basically took about a month of CPU time doing this at the hartree fock level, correcting it for the CCSD parentheses T. Benrus took this data and did exactly the same thing he did for the CH5+. Plus. Um, so this is the um, predicted energies. These are the reference energies. This is looking at the distribution. You can see it's nicely uniformly um, distributed around zero. Also, again, the training error is on the order of about 60 wave numbers, test error around 34. If we compare that to CH5+, plus, it's really very comparable accuracy to what we were able to get for CH5+. Plus. So it looks promising. And the, on the other hand, can we do anything with this? Can we learn anything about this ion from this? And so then Fenris went in and ran production DMC simulations he was complaining that when he had ensemble sizes of a million watt-crits, it was kind of taking a long time. Up until now, up until a year or so ago, I would have never dreamed of suggesting doing an ensemble even um, probably a, certainly even a tenth as large as that, but he can do it. And it, you know, it takes a lot of time, which means it takes a couple hours. Um, but we can take the ground state probability amplitude we can, for example, ask what the vibrationally average rotational constants are based on a CCSD parentheses T level calculation. We could also look at basically how large amplitude is this motion back and forth. And this distribution is projecting that, that onto um, the distance of this carbon and the hydrogen and this carbon and the hydrogen. And it's somewhat reminiscent of what we saw with the H5 plus. It's obviously very large amplitude. You can see that there, centered around this equilibrium structure. And Fenris has pulled out a handful of structures that actually do get over into where the proton does get over into this region. I think we determined it was about one in 10 to the fifth. So it's probably not going to be all that important in the ground state, but it'll be interesting to see as we vibrationally excite this guy, what's going on. So that's really the story I have to share right now. Um, some just take home messages is that we've talked about some extensions that are allowing us to look at, use the DMC to study systems that have large amplitude motions. And especially with this neural net version of the DMC, it's actually allowing us to probe molecules and molecular ions with large amplitude motions where we don't have access to potential energies going into this. Obviously, I was not the one who did the vast majority of this work or these calculations. This was really, as I said, Fenris was really the one who led a lot of this along with Ryan. Um, Mark did a lot of work in terms of some of the parallelization that made this possible. And Mickey is also, who just joined the group this fall, is also joining in. And this has really benefited from a collaboration um, with Tom Miller's group, particularly the student, Sherry Chang. So I will stop there and I hope I've left some time for some questions and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor McCoy. So if you have questions, oh, there's some that are already popping up, please put them into the question and answer box. Ross Henderson asked, would there be an advantage of using deep learning constructs for the uh, distributive Monte Carlo, maybe using a multiple of CNNs, RNNs, multi-level perceptrons, et cetera. 
that wouldn't require a training set. Unsupervised learning? I'll be honest, I we have not thought about that, and I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we could think about doing. Um, you know, one of the challenges is going to be just the number of potential evaluations we need to have, and so I would worry about um, about trying to do. It's just we need a lot of potential evaluations to even get started. So I don't know, but I really haven't thought about this either. Thank you. Do we have some other questions? Are there any other test systems that you're thinking about where you have some experimental data, but there aren't potentials already developed that you could look at or that you're thinking about looking at? Well, the direction, I mean, the direction we really want to push this in is looking at some protonated water clusters where there are potentials out there, but they get complicated for going up to larger systems and um, where, you know, there's always, it's always when you, a lot of these are based on combining um, combining information from smaller clusters to build up larger ones. And while that can be very effective, you can also miss some of the higher, higher body, the, some of the information from interactions of multi-body, mul multiple pieces. And so that's one place where we're really trying to think about what we can do to extend into that direction. Also looking at some hydrogen bonding and larger water clusters. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that, those are the directions that we really have been focused in to, to a good extent lately, and that's where we're probably heading, although these um, protonated alkanes are fun, and so I have a feeling we may, we may look at a few more of those before we're done. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question real quick? Um, sure. Does, uh, does this uh, neural net strategy, um, might it enable you to uh, calculate like vibrationally excited states instead of just the, the zero point level? So a lot of that comes back to the diffusion Monte Carlo on um, which is if one works through it is really a ground state method. And so we've got we've been working a lot over the years on tricks to get excited states. And so, for example, one thing one can envision doing for this system is you could imagine telling the wave function that I need to have a node when these two um, distances are equal. And so we can ask what is the lowest energy state that has the property that the wave function changes sign in this geometry. And that would give us information about that particular excited state. Ryan has done a lot of work also in looking at how much can you pull out a ground state probability amplitudes to get insights into spectroscopy. But it's a little, this method is not particularly well suited for excited states. And it's really not about the neural net part. It's really just about the diffusion Monte Carlo is limited. Um, we have done, and I, hid the slide, um, but we have done some calculations with our neural net DM, our neural net potential for water just to check how the vibrational energies are for vibrationally excited states. And those actually look very good. So if one had a method that would allow for calculations of excited states, that should work quite well. Uh, okay, so, oh, go ahead. I, I can read these too. Um, oh, so it great. looks like we have a question from our purser that says, have you looked at using um, the neural net DMC to interrogate salvation energies, um, hydrogen bonding and low, um, low temperature salvation cages? Um, that's a direction. At this point, we've used it only for water monomer, water dimer, CH5 plus, and um, this protonated ethylene. We'd really like to think about using it for the water clusters. Um, one of the challenges we've had is we were basing it, we've been trying to do it, and we've been basing it off of the MB pole potential off the, out of the Paisani group. And that potential, it turns out, has some discontinuities that are not relevant when you're doing classical MD or when you're looking at low energy structures, but actually affect, um, have some effect, or we're finding that they're having some effect as we're doing some of the, trying to sample some of the high energy regions and they're making it very hard for us to fit the potentials. And so this is something Fenris has spent most of the summer 
struggling with and we're trying to find either other water potentials or even the other option is to go straight go back to the um mobml or the machine learned um ccsd energies from the hard tree frog but that's a direction that we definitely want to be thinking about um, again it would be water clusters probably not solution just because we're really trying to look at these smaller smaller systems did that answer your question um the next question says do you plan on sharing the neural net um, code in the um near future for use by others so the um the paper that we've published um, has all the parameters for the neural net potentials in the uh, in the supporting information. The DMC code that does this is open source, and I think I put it somewhere in here, but it's called PyVib, P-Y-V-I-B, DMC, and if you Google it, you can find, find the code to, to run with it. And Mark Johnson um, asks about OH minus water and protonated ammonia dimer. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And Mark, yeah, I mean these are ones that would be really fun fun to think about. Um, we've certainly done a lot with OH minus water, with the DMC, with you over the years, um, and certainly that's you know those that's another direction. Um, and I, you know, it's it's all a matter of um, figuring out where to start. But did this, to be honest, all of the calculations of the um, energies for this for this one that I just showed you. We're done over the Christmas break, so this is all really new at this point for us. But yeah, I mean, you know, we we'd like to do that. We'd also like to look at some of the larger protonated water clusters, where one sees um, I saw different different equilibrium structures. If you're all H or all D, which um, you and I have discussed. And if there are any other questions. I don't see any more. Um, I just submitted a message to the, the chat. So AFSCON 2022 has a couple of astrochemistry related symposia. Um, so the abstract deadline is next Wednesday. Check it out, see if you're interested. I wanna thank Professor McCoy and Charles Law for giving great talks today and all of you for attending. We appreciate you. And we're looking forward to seeing you next month for the February astrochemar. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.